I'd like to open this session, please. So it's my great pleasure to welcome this morning the winner of the 2022 Peter Wildley Prize, Dr. Diane Ashuri Oradopai, the lead pharmacist for antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections from the UK Health Security Agency and the global AMR lead for the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. The Peter Wildley Prize is as awarded for outstanding contributions to microbiology education or the communication of microbiology to the public. Diane has led several multi-country and international projects, workshops and training events on tackling AMR, including assessing knowledge, attitudes and behaviours of healthcare workers. She is also an outspoken advocate for antimicrobial stewardship and has made substantial contributions in this field. In September 2014, she conceived, developed, and continues to lead the Global Antibiotic Guardian campaign, which is underpinned by behavioral science. So far, more than 145,000 pledges have been made on the Antibiotic um, Guardian website by over 120,000 individ individuals in more than 180 countries worldwide. Today, she will talk about tackling antimicrobial resistance moving from raising awareness to professional engagement and public action. Diane. On the 10th of November 2021, I was sat at my desk. It was the week before World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, SBAR report, which is our national surveillance report for antimicrobial utilization and resistance was about to be published. I was exhausted, I was tired. My colleagues and I were working hard to get the final stages done. An email comes in and it says, on behalf of the Chief Executive of the Microbiology Society, I invite you to accept the 2022 Peter Wilder Prize. I had no idea what that meant. So I Googled and um, I found out that to get the prize, you needed to have been involved and given your permission. So back into my emails I went. When and how and who did I give information to? So I found out that I think it was in 2019 or maybe early 2020, Professor Lee Suckett had asked me for some information, but I didn't pay much attention because she said, provide me details about Antibiotic Guardian and what you do, so I did. So I started crying. I cried and cried, and it was ugly tears, not the nice pat-pat. And it was ugly tears, but it was gratitude te tears. Because for me, I was in the middle of an exhaustion period of time, and it's the same every year. I've been leading or working on antibiotic resistance and antibiotic awareness since 2010, when I joined Health Protection Agency. Um, and oftentimes you think, is it all worth it? Is it making a difference? And I also knew that it wasn't my colleagues within pharmacy, so I'm a pharmacist, so I was a pharmacist getting an award from Microbiology Society. I was truly honored and amazed. And there were also, so there were not my direct colleagues from within work and they were not from pharmacy. I think that's what made it even more special for me. So again, thank you to Microbiology Society. Thank you, Professor Lily Suckett and the co-nominator, Dr. Emma Banks. Today, I'm going to talk you through how we went from tackle, around tackling antimicrobial resistance, where we moved from awareness to professional engagement and public action. I'm often accused that I use a lot of we when I talk. That's because whilst I lead, and I do lead, and I do take a lot of personal responsibility and action and hours of work around this, none of this is ever possible on your own. So today I'll be sharing with you my journey so far from my pharmacy degree up to date, how we move from awareness to en engagement, healthcare, work healthcare workers, healthcare colleagues, scientists, health students, the public, including children and young people, global engagement, also communicating globally, how I'm going beyond antimicrobial resistance. I'll share what I've learned along the way and how this has helped me to sidestep, step over, barriers. And when I start to share, a lot of what I share with you today 
more sim simple, easy. It's what we do. It's become commonplace. But remember that when this started, it was 2013, 2014. It wasn't as easy then. So I grew up in Northampton and I decided to um, go for a pharmacy degree. In fact, I remember going to a community pharmacist who said to me, I was thinking, should I go for medicine? Should I go for pharmacy? And the community pharmacist said, your woman is better for you to go for pharmacy. At that time, I was not impressed. However, it was the best thing that could have happened to me, not the woman part being the reason to go for pharmacy, but actually what I've been able to do through pharmacy degree and actually being able to use my love for science and also going beyond um, direct patient care um, and also going to population level, which is what has happened now, not what I planned when I started off. So I went off to Bradford because they, were, they had a sandwich course, which meant I could have an opportunity to experience community, more, more than one sector of pharmacy during my pre-registration year. So I went off to Boots in, uh, in, in Northampton as a community pharmacy and also Northampton General as my hospital placement. Whilst I was at Bradford, I did do a second year um, summer placement in my second year. I think that gave me the passion for research um, and as you can see there, that certificate hangs in my parents' house. I have no idea where the original is, but a photocopy hangs on my parents' um, wall of their children's certificates. Um, and on the, I won the final year prize for um, research, for my dissertation. I share that because it started to give me the passion for research, for using information for action. Whilst I was also at Bradford, I was, I was a radio host and also I was part of the pharmacy association and I was an IT executive. This information will come back later when I share with you what I've learned along the way. When I finished my degree, I went off to Oxford Radcliffe Hospitals and was a resident pharmacist. People often talk about seven day working now. We were doing seven day working then, seven days, seven nights. Um, we were on call all night and actually based on site as well. Then I went off to do my PhD. Remember, I talked about the research interests that I had as an undergraduate. And I went to the School of Pharmacy in, in London. Those pictures there are my graduation, <laughs> because whilst I was doing my PhD, I decided to get married, have a child. Um, I don't, maybe not as clever, but life had to continue. And that photo is myself and my sisters changing my daughter's nappy with me in my graduation gown. Um, and in those days, I didn't know I could, get a, I could take maternity leave, so I didn't. I just worked through the process and got through my PhD degree. Learning, again, come back, to, it'll come back and circle when we come to what I've learned over time. When, that had, when I finished, I went back into hospital. I was interested in having direct patient contact and not so much industry or academia, so I went back into um, hospital. And what happened was I, I started to have experience in different parts of the hospital. And then one day I was called down from the ward. Usually when you get called down as a pharmacist, it means that you've had an error. And I was just praying that a patient hadn't been seriously harmed by my error. But actually what they were calling me for was to take on um, a maternity cover in antimicrobials. I, I didn't plan it. I was scared. And I remember thinking to myself, absolutely not. There's no way I could do this. But I just saw myself shaking and nodding my head, and that was it, it was too late, I was committed. And then after a while, I moved on to um, Health Protection Agency at that time because they were looking for pharmacists three days a week to work with the Department of Health Advisory, Ex Expert Advisory Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance and Health Gaseated Infections. Um, and also, um, I kept on two days a week in a hospital. Whilst I was in Mid-Essex hospitals, actually I was very much embedded with the microbiology team and the infection prevention and control. It wasn't normal, it wasn't the calm, it wasn't the norm in those days, but I chose to be an integral part of that team and those were my, um, the IPC colleagues that I worked with. And that gave me significant experience as I moved on into Health Protection Agency, which then became Public Health England and I moved into a full-time role in 2015. At that, through my time at PHE and now UKHSA, I've had opportunities to be seconded into other roles, so Health Education England to develop um, a national training program on antimicrobial resistance, also um, other organisations as well. I just thought I'd share a couple of things that I did whilst I was in, within hospital, um, and you can see there around blood culture packs and streptomonas um, multifilia. 
I, I put together this slide as I was putting together my, um, my portfolio for, to be a credit credentialed as a consultant, and I'd completely forgotten that I was so embedded within microbiology and, and, and leading some of this work around um, antispirograms and, and streptomonas. And then I went off to Barkenhaven and Redbridge again and, and did similar work educating my colleagues, really focused on healthcare professionals and healthcare colleagues, um, encouraging them to make good use of antimicrobials and antimicrobial stewardship, which is my focus area. Over time, though, as I moved into Health Protection Agency, I realized that I, wasn't, I was no longer full-time on the front line, and it was really difficult because, actually, as a pharmacist, I started getting the question, are you still a real pharmacist? Um, and I guess it, that happens again with scientists when we start to move into um, comms and, and other areas. People start to wonder, is this still real science? Is this still real health? But what I then did was to get comfortable within that or learn to get comfortable and I started to explore additional um, training and education for myself and I went off to start a master's in public health during my maternity leave for my second child. I'm, I'm not a glutton for punishment, I promise. So for more than 10 years, I focused on tackling antimicrobial resistance initially at individual patient level and then at population level. A lot of what I'm going to share with you is me standing on the shoulders of giants. The lady you can see there, many of you will probably recognize, is Professor Dame Sally Davis, who was the chief medical officer for a long time and actually is the reason why I believe is the reason why antimicrobial resistance and tackling antimicrobial resistance, along with many others, but she was a, a strong catalyst for that, particularly at government level and then internationally, um, in tackling antimicrobial resistance, both at global level and domestic. And so this was where you'll see how the work I do contributes to the national action plan as well. But initially, as a lead pharmacist for AMR, I really focused on stewardship, um, competencies for prescribing and really around healthcare workers, that's where my focus uh, um, was. And you can see the Star Smart Down focus. Um, the, the top one on the left there was the very first version and me typing that out. Um, and then by the time we got to 2015, it looked much better because other colleagues had gotten involved who were, had better design skills than I did. But European Antibiotic Awareness Day had been around since 2010, and so when I joined Health Protection Agency, or pre that actually, um, I was leading, I was a project lead um, for um, developing the tools and resources for European Antibiotic Awareness Day. Um, so some more information around Statsman then focus, which is one of our, our key toolkits for um, antimicrobial stewardship in secondary care. So why and how did becoming tackling antimicrobial resistance become more than a day job for me? And I truly believe that it is more than a day job for me. It was in 2013 when I watched the story of this, late, this young lady, as she was then, Addie. She was 11 years old and she, was from, she, she lived in the States. And I remember the video clearly, she was on a roller coaster um, and then um, she had a scratch. Her mom took her into hospital because she just felt a little bit off, just a little bit. By the time she came out of hospital five months later, she was in a wheelchair, double lung transplant. And for me, I thought, how does you go from a scratch to, be, to having double lung transplant and then in a wheelchair? That absolutely scared me. I was a mom, I had two children, and I suddenly panicked and thought, actually, if this can happen to her, and a mom's a nurse, actually, that can happen to anyone, and what can I do to make a difference? How do I start to communicate this information in a more significant way than I had done, focusing on members of the public, focusing on my family members and other people around me? I followed the story of Addie for a long time and um, she remained, she came out of hospital, lived till the teenage years. Sadly, she passed away either last year or the year before. But she lived till her 20s. Um, so the UK MR National Action Plan, um, 2013 to 18, um, was, that was then being developed at that time. At 20, I just watched the video. And within that, talked about improving professional education, training and public engagement. At the same time, I was asked to take on lead to become the chair for European Antibiotic Awareness Day. So I'd moved from being the project lead and there usually was a chair. And so I was asked to become a chair. And when you're asked to become a chair and you work in the same organization, it means you do double work. You chair the organized chair the committee and also you project lead. But at that time, and, and I guess in some ways people still argue this, that antimicrobial resistance can be poorly communicated and widely misunderstood. We've been working really hard um, to, to change that. 
But what's really key is that every infection that we do prevent means that less antibiotics are used and hopefully that will reduce antimicrobial resistance. I know that there are other reasons why, um, we, why um, inf resistance occurs, but one of this is if we can prevent infections in the first instance. So, in 1990, taking you back to the timeline of where we were in terms of antibiotic awareness when I took on the chair. So we had antibiotic. Does anyone remember antibiotic? Because I don't remember it at all. Um, but it was there and we dug through the files and we found antibiotic, don't wear me out. But in 2008, just two years before I joined Health Protection Agency, the Department of Health and NHS had launched this posters and it went out to all um, GP surgeries, community pharmacies, and, uh, and was in use. But it was about awareness. It was really just providing information. And then I was asked to take on the chair, so I started to think, actually needed to evaluate what we'd done over time. And so I did the evaluation, and I wanted to uh, move at that time, started to think, how do we move from just throwing out information? How do we know what people are thinking? How do we know if they're engaged? How do we know if they care? Um, and so, and also, how do we move from having just something that happens in November, the week or the day, 18th of November as it was then, um, to something that was available all year round? And how do we move into engagement? And so how do we get some commitment from colleagues that they're going to take action? And it was the first year that the lead organization with PHE at that time could, were going to directly um, work and engage with the public. I had no funding. Um, it was considered risky, so remember in those days, asking someone to go on a website to provide their details was not done as, as robustly. But there was, NH, there was an NHS campaign at that time, which were asking healthcare professionals to sign up. So no funding, how do I get a website going? I, it was at a conference actually, the ECMID conference. I spoke to the chief executive of BSAC and just shared what I was thinking about and she said, well, we can try and do something to support. So we progressed it, and obviously it needs to be evidence-based, so started to work through and read through and research, how do you develop something that links to commitment and also evidence-based approach? And then working with a planning group of more than 60 members, we developed what is now, what is, and what I'm about to share with you. And I say we because actually every time I researched and found information, I needed to present it to the group for them to um, agree and for them to um, disagree and for us to have a discussion. So by September 2014, we launched a single page. Um, at that time, there was no organization name on it because in case it went wrong, it would just be something Diane did and it will just be forgotten. Um, and set a goal to have 10,000 pledges by 30th of November, and we launched in September. There was no media funding. There was no, I, I wasn't quite sure how we would get the information out there, but I hoped that colleagues would help. And as you can see there, we got to 9,423 on the 18th of November. I have to say, it was a bottom-up approach. It was healthcare colleagues, it was colleagues all over the country sharing the information and encouraging people to go onto the website, and you'll see a few more things about the website shortly. And then also, um, um, and then by 30th of November, we met, before 30th of November, we met our goal of 10,000 pledges. So this is what the webpage looked like. It was a single page at that point in time, and it made a call for everyone in the UK to become an antibiotic guardian by choosing a pledge. And we used the behavior change approach called If Then, um, which is when, you know, for example, if you're trying to lose weight, you can say, if I feel like eating chocolate, I will reach out for a banana instead. Doesn't quite do the same, but it's a making that promise ahead of time. And so that's the approach we took. We were able to find Dr. Chris Van Tilliken, um, Susan Hopkins, um, who many of you may know, worked closely with him then. He wasn't as famous as he is now, but he was still a TV doctor at that time, and he agreed to um, record the video for us. And so there were key messages for the members of the public. Do not demand antibiotics. Ask a pharmacist how to treat your symptoms. Take antibiotics exactly as prescribed. Never save for later. Never give to someone else. And then spread in the word. And then asking them to choose a pledge. And then you get onto the page, and there are tailored pages for each group, healthcare professionals, members of the public, and students and educators as well. We continued with, in terms of our activities for World and European Antibiotic Awareness Day and had um, resources available. We moved on to start having social media, uh, graphics, resources, toolkit. We continued to use the posters that were available and developed a couple of other ones. Then I 
I had this idea that the chief professional officers, in the past it was just the um, chief pharmacist who signed the letter, but I had this idea that why can't I ask all the other chief professional officers to sign a letter? I was told by my comms colleague that uh, too many signatures on the letter doesn't work, um, it would look too messy, and as I didn't give up, I kept asking and then I started talking to the different colleagues within the chief professional officers. Um, offices, and as you can see there, I think the first year we had seven signatures, including the HEE chief exec and also PHE's chief, chief exec at that time. We then started to move to new groups, um, increasing local implementation and participation, started to talk about healthcare students and what they could do, young families and children, and at that time we collaborated with the nursing colleagues in, in PHE and Make Waves as it was then, and used digital badges to encourage children to um, learn more about antibiotic resistance and then they could get, get a badge. We also worked through community pharmacy, TV, newspaper, blogs, I was contacted then by BBC One Doctors and asked to contribute to one, um, to one of their episodes um, around superheroes. I think what happened is once we started Antibiotic Garden, people were starting to look for ways in which they could engage and actually they could phys physically and visibly show that they were engaged in the, in the activities. So, um, yep, for Euro World European Antibiotic Awareness Day, there was an episode on, on doctors um, around um, antibiotic um, awareness. And then we also developed two um, uh, posters for, for dentists, and we also started to use blogs more. Play bars, this, we now have so many online game and um, quiz. In those days, play bars, I think, was the only one. We also um, had some uh, antibiotic awareness on there so that people could learn. So we could then actually start to track people engaging and, um, and getting involved. And, and so these are just some photos from, from the early years. You can see the different branding for Antibiotic Guardian as we had it then. And you can see industry was engaged, students were engaged, um, hospitals were engaged. Um, and then also on social media, I think I was in a meeting and I think Jeremy Hunt was in the meeting and I said, can you choose a pledge? And tweeted. I didn't think it would happen, but it did. And Dame Sally, um, obviously, there with her book as well, um, there. And then people started to use uh, different ways to engage people, including bribery. <laughs> and you can see their edible petri dishes as well as an example, but uh, sweets um, uh, and bugs and, and a range of ways for people to engage. We rebranded re in 2017 when the Cube Antibiotics Working campaign was launched. So that's a public media campaign and that was launched and we rebranded the Antibiotic Guardian to, to look like, um, to, to be in line with that. And you can see then the website um, got expanded. What I didn't expect when um, Antibiotic Guardian started was that it would become international. Um, it was supposed to be UK wide, in fact it was England, and then it became UK, but actually when we were doing our first set of analysis we suddenly realised that there were more than 129 countries where we had had pledges from. And then I started to get contacts from my colleagues in um, WHO Europe and Belgium and South Africa saying, actually, we want to um, get involved with Antibiotic Guardian as well. And you can see there that we have some translations and tailored pledges for those countries, and I'm grateful to them. Um, examples of public pledges, um, as you can see, their way for action is that, you know, um, for infections that our bodies um, are good at fighting off on their own, like coughs, colds, um, try, treating them, try to, treating the symptoms first rather than going to GP. If the NHS offers me flu vaccination, I pledge to accept. Um, if I'm prescribed antibiotics, I'll take them exactly as prescribed and never save them for later. And then some actions from, the, from members of the public. By December 2021, we had 20,000 pledges from members of the public. Bear in mind that there is no media campaign on this, so this doesn't go on TV. So this has got to be through our individuals um, sharing with other with members of the public um, and you can we have pledges for pet owners and horse owners um, we had students as part of the public pledges initially and then they got their own separate um, section in 2017 and we also have pledges for farmers as well I forgot to bring my timer when I came up here so I just need someone to let me know how long I've got left um, examples of publics, we also then created an option for them to create their own pledges and um, you can see the examples of people choose writing their own pledges. Um, I will make family and friends and local community aware of the project. I pledge that, um, I like this one, um, I will encourage people to take proper consultation from a doctor if they're sick because each body is different. 
Um, there was one that said, I, won't share, I will not share my antibiotics um, with others, even if they have similar symptoms to me. Uh, and then we have continue to have public resources linking it with um, the um, Keep Antibiotics Working campaign. We also have patient stories um, because that's important for people to learn. That's how I, that's how tackling AMR became more than a day job for me, was seeing a patient's story. And so we have those stories on Antibiotic Guardian website as well. And then in 2016, um, supplements into newspapers started and I was asked to get involved and to share resources for um, Antibiotic Guardian through the news, newspapers. And here are just some of the articles that I led and but several colleagues and some of you may be in this room have provided articles that go into these supplements and they've gone into The Guardian, into The Independent and this year went into World, um, into The New Scientist uh, as an example. I've been asked to um, give TEDx contributions. Again, when I'm asked to do this uh, various talks, and, and I did quite a bit of them, often it was really an opportunity for me to share and for me to get that message across and to encourage more people to get involved. Engaging healthcare students, and so, and I think this is how Professor Liz Suckett um, found out, just time, thank you. Um, this is how Professor Lee Suckett found out about me. We, in, it was actually a third year pharmacy student who came and said, we need to have a conference. We're not taught enough about antimicrobial resistance and what we can do about it in our degree. What can we do? And so because of that one student, we have had a national um, student conference and it's multidisciplinary um, every year since, um, since 2017. And you can see that we have students from multidisciplinary and multidisciplinary backgrounds who attend, including science students as well as health students. Um, and we used to run them on a Saturday and we would have more than 150 students from around the country turn up to these events. 2020 though, of course, we ran it virtually and then in 2021 we did it as an on-demand module course. Um, and all the, and, and where every time we, um, we run the conference, we always uh, do a, pre, we try and do a pre and post knowledge, attitudes and behavior, understanding of the students' um, learning as well. This is just some photos and some tweets of the one on the top left is um, my very first tweet when we had the 2017 and the King's College um, photo and the one next to it are the students who led the conference. I provided guidance, but they were very much the ones leading that conference in the first year. Um, and you can see there um, two of them. So Professor Lutz, <laughs> I've mentioned it in quite a bit, but she was very, very popular amongst the students and they requested her year after year. Um, and she talked to us about predatory um, bacteria and how that can be used as one of the solutions for tackling AMR. Um, again, it was a One Health conference, so we had colleagues from v BVA, so the British Veterinary Association as well. And also continue to engage and, and get, encourage children and young people to, involve you, to be involved. You can see there that we um, provide education and training, but we always encourage them to show their learning. And, and so they started to create posters. And the photo in the middle there with the children, there was, I think, uh, in, in the West Midlands, where the children who won the competition, um, their posters were around the hospitals and also, I think, in the local library uh, for one of the years. And again, you can see there an opportunity. Not only are the children um, being educated, they're educating their parents as well, because any of you know, if, if children bring homework home in primary school, it's actually more the parents' homework rather than the children's homework. Um, and then we um, started to work um, closely and we also developed a badge for, um, for youth groups as well. And that was in collaboration with the eBug team who um, lead significant work around educating children, young people, right from primary school all the way to secondary school. Really encourage that you use the resources. Some of the, a lot of the science information that is on that website, I go to today whenever I want to um, develop lectures for, even for university students, because they are really, really helpful. Um, and what's really great is that they're available in multiple languages as well. I, I get, I started to be asked for, for different things and I was asked to get involved in writing uh, a children's book um, led by Osborne, What Are Germs? And myself and my colleague Karen Shaw uh, got involved in, in helping write that book. Um, and, and you can see that it's published, it's available. Um, and, and just, I'd completely forgotten that I actually did this again until I was recently. Um, what I think what this talk has made me do is to go back and reflect on the different activities that I've, take, that I've undertaken over the years. 
In terms of antibiotic guardian pledges, you can see that we surpassed 100,000 pledges in 2020, um, and we also have an organization's um, pledge where organizations can choose a pledge about how they will encourage um, antimicrobial stewardship and also tackling antimicrobial resistance. And you can see how the pledges have changed over or have increased over time with us, with most of the pledges happening in 2020 during the challenging year that we've had, still in the challenging year. Evaluating the campaign is critical, it's really important for me. I really, um, one of the soapboxes I get on is about the importance of sharing knowledge, particularly when you're working and where you're developing policy and, and also national guidelines. We often get to it and we are looking for information and looking for published evidence to be able to, um, to, be able to use to inform um, practice and it can be challenging. So I was putting, um, you know, I was making sure that I was doing what I could talk about, and so the campaign has been evaluated uh, through a range of, of means, and often I'm part of the team mainly to provide information, but I always encourage others to be the ones to lead on the evaluation so that it is independent or as independent as possible. And then every year through the SPAR report, we will always have information about what's happened with Antibiotic Guardian in that year. So when um, my introduction was read, it was 149,000. So that was when I wrote my bio in November 2021, I believe. When I looked at the website um, on the 2nd of April, when I was writing this, my slides, and there were 169,225. So you can see that even through, where, where, um, through the year, people are continuing to choose pledges. Um, and so that's what we really want is that all year round opportunity for people to engage in tackling antimicrobial resistance. Then I started to be, get involved in, in global um, activities and, 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 and communicating globally. Um, and one of the ways that that's really um, become even more, became more significant was when I started as an advisor, giving my time, um, volunteering my time with the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association, who um, support pharmacist education across all the Commonwealth countries, and there are one million pharmacists across those countries. Majority of them are in low middle income countries. So I started to volunteer my time with them in 2016, particularly focusing on resources for World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, using learning that I had gained from my work in Health Protection Agency and PHE as it was then. And then in 2017, we were asked to um, consider putting in a, a, a bid or a research bid, a, a funding bid to support um, four African countries um, in tackling antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. And then that's when my, I would say, working globally became even more significant for me. Um, and you can see there that in the four countries we worked in, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and, Gam and Ghana, um, and it was a partnership approach, so UK institutions partnered with institutions in those four countries, uh, and there were 12 partners, uh, partnerships across those, um, those four countries, and you can see we had 187 volunteers within the UK. I was the, pro the, tech, the global AMR lead for CPA, so the technical lead who helped develop the, 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 the bid um, in terms of what do we need to do, and what can we do to tackle antimicrobial resistance, how can we support colleagues in, in these four countries to take action in tackling antimicrobial resistance, obviously working with um, other colleagues within CPA as well. And we developed a range of tools, again, um, um, within that time period. Um, and then um, in 2018, we had an opportunity, again, to uh, ask for more funding and so that we could expand our work. And I think linked to that and being able to get that, off, that funding goes back to sharing knowledge and not only get, gathering the evidence for report, but publishing and making sure that it was peer reviewed so that colleagues can, um, so that I guess we had the, the evidence we were generating was, was considered more robust. And so I led um, those, those um, publications and um, between myself, colleagues, and also the partnerships, by the time we did the initial evaluation, there were 14 peer review publications from the, um, from the program, which is called the Commonwealth Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship. As a result of that, additional funding came up and was made a, an option, and so again, we put in a, an application working with TEF, who is a tropical education uh, tropical Health Education Trust, um, and now that that's expanded into eight countries, and you can see the eight countries then there. 
uh, and an additional part to that was um, I left my, I resigned from my role as CPA um, just at the end of March, but just before uh, I left, I was supporting and leading um, uh, a new program of work which has expanded into 22 countries. Part of the reason why I resigned was the opportunity for others to be able to take on that role and that lead role, and, and, and I guess succession, I had been succession planning for a while. I say to people I'm still really young, but I'm really a strong believer in empowering others and also succession planning. So some of the activities that we did focus particularly on members of the public is around the stewardship game, which is an opportunity for people to learn and it's available um, virtually. For an online version, it's available in face-to-face. -face. And you know, we developed this during the pandemic and we were worried that actually the, the board games will never get used. But this year, um, with the eight partnerships, you can see um, colleagues in Malawi, Syria, Leone, and also the global, um, the global tournaments we had. We've been able to use that game to, to, to start sharing learning and to engage people. We have to remember that whilst we're microbiologists or scientists in this room, we understand what AMI is, why it's important. There are some people that don't know why they should care. And there are healthcare, healthcare workers who, yes, they know it's important, but they may not truly understand the impact of it. And so this provides an opportunity for us to engage them. And so then we started to create a video, and we created uh, four videos um, in eight accents. It's been interesting and challenging. Um, and I'm going to share one of the videos with you in a moment, but there are four videos. Three of them are mainly for healthcare workers, but one of them is also targeted at members of the public. I probably won't play all of this, but I'll make the, the, um, the link available um, so that you can watch it. So just enjoy. Ama is now a mother and took her child to the pharmacist for advice as she was concerned. Her baby has a cough, runny nose, and is feeling hot. She returns home and speaks to her husband about the pharmacist's advice. Ama, how is our baby? What did the pharmacist say? It is okay. The pharmacist said she has a mild viral infection. So did he give you antibiotics for her? No, he did not. He said the antibiotics don't work for a virus. So what did he give you then? He gave me some advice on how to look after her and how to tell if she gets worse. He was very reassuring. He said that we should take her to a doctor immediately if she gets any worse or we are worried about her. So no medicine? That doesn't make sense. As she is normally fit and healthy, he said that her body should be able to fight the virus without medicine. He told me that it's important that we wash our hands regularly and practice good hygiene to try and stop ourselves catching the virus and spreading it to others. He also reminded me that her vaccinations are due next month and it's really important that we take her for them as they will stop her getting other more serious illnesses. Oh. Do you think we should go try and buy some antibiotics just in case we get ill too? I really can't take any time off work. No. The pharmacist said it is really important that we don't buy antibiotics and that we only take antibiotics when a health worker tells us we need them. Why? What's the problem? We are taking too many antibiotics, often for illnesses where they don't work, because of this, they no longer work on some of the germs that they are used for. The pharmacist said it could be a big problem and antibiotics might not work when we really need them next time we are sick. If we preserve antibiotics for when they are really needed, we are doing something that can and will save lives. It might be our baby's life in the future that we save by our actions today. Oops. So what have I learned over the years? Sorry, the slide that I didn't show there is um, the acknowledgement slide, which show, we talked about the fact that um, it was funded by the Fleming Fund through UK Aid and a collaboration between Commonwealth Pharmacists Association and the Tropical, Education, Tropical Health and Education Trust. Over the years, some of the things I've learned is around being tenacious. I'm um, saying yes when scared. I did not plan to go into... Um, antimicrobials or infections as my specialist area when I went back for my PhD, but saying yes when I was asked to take on that maternity post is the reason why I'm here um, about 
13 years later, or for more than 13 years later. Um, uh, then asked, being asked to chair EAD um, again was another opportunity that I was absolutely petrified about because this was done by professors. This was, I was a young pharmacist when I walked into, when I started in Health Protection Agency and it was very senior colleagues who chaired this big groups and I was suddenly being asked to chair. Um, so we're grateful to line, line managers who see something in you and, and give you an opportunity to try. Getting a broad range of pharmacy and non-pharmacy experience, I talked earlier about being an IT officer um, or public, um, and also radio host. Those skills are some of the skills that I've been able to use. I have access to the back end of Antibiotic Guardian website. I make a lot of the changes that happen on Antibiotic Guardian website myself, mainly because there is often the time lag um, working with, um, with web developers, but there is a web team who, again, thankfully funded, was initially funded by BSAC, but now all fully funded by PHE and UKHSA, who lead on, on the key technical aspects. Outside of my role, website development, mentoring all the social media. For those, uh, I get asked this question a lot. If you're interested in having a family and a satisfying career, there is no such thing as a perfect time to start. Um, being willing to learn, adapt, and continuously learn is important. Um, I read about CV of failures. I was um, reflecting and share with my family this week. Uh, there was a post that I didn't get 10 years ago, I saw the person who got the post celebrate their, their, their anniversary, and, and at that time I was devastated I didn't get that role. But if I got that role, I wouldn't be here today um, and leading on, on, on tackling AMR at a national level. Find people you admire. I have remote mentors, people I stalk on social media. I learn from them and, and take learning from them. Network and collaboration is really key. So I'm examples of, of me collaborating um, across within our organization, but also through ESPA, which is uh, a multi-professional and multi-organization group with more than um, 20 member organizations nationally. Um, I take on external roles because they increase my opportunity to collaborate and to advocate. So I'm an editor across um, a, a number of journals, but also the Commonwealth Pharmacists I talked about on the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and UK Infection Network. I learn a lot from other colleagues and then use that in my day-to-day -day roles. Generate and share evidence. I, I've talked about the importance of that. Um, it's not just publication for publication's sake. It is because actually you're stopping someone else from um, duplicating efforts. You're sharing information that can be really important for us to develop national guidelines and policy. Social media is an important tool. Um, it's, it's, it's critical. I noticed this morning that I apparently have had 20,000 tweets. I do tweet a lot, particularly around conferences and for Antibiotic Guardian um, over, over the years when I do that. But it also gives you opportunity to connect with people globally. And there's so many people I've met across the world that I wouldn't have been able to. Knock, seek, and ask. Um, you just never know where the opportunity may come across. I'm really focusing now on trying to support pharmacy colleagues to move into population health. Those who are in interested um, at a more, uh, uh, because actually that's where we can have more impact when we start to focus on population uh, uh, and, and not only the individual patient in front of us. I had the opportunity to work with um, WHO as well, again as a result of me asking the question, can I support, can I volunteer my time? Um, being transformed through the seasons of your life, I fully understand and embrace the different seasons in my life and careers. There are high moments, there are low moments, there are times when I can do more, there are times when I can do less. But most importantly, I, I try to be kind to myself. Sometimes it's easier said than done, though. And not, so many people have in, inspired me along the way, but these three ladies are critical for different purposes. The lady on the left, Ralia Tonotade, all I did was saw her name in publications when I went back after my PhD. That's what made me realize that actually I can publish practice research. And so then I started to publish. I just started something very small with the drug charts that we had. We were not the first um, hospital to have a drug chart at that time, but we were the first to, to write about it in, in the PJ. Um, Susan Hopkins, who some of you may know, she was my colleague for many years and, and always challenged me. She was the one when I said, Antibiotic Guardian, I want to develop it. She said, all good. And I said, well, within three months, I want 100,000 pledges. She said, that's not going to happen. You don't have funding. It's not going to happen. Think, change your strategy. So then we, we worked together and I went to 10,000 pledges instead of 100,000. So uh, thank you, Susan, for that. What wisdom. And then Claire Howard was when um, she was the Deputy Chief Pharmaceutical Officer 
several years ago, but there was a time when it all got too much and I felt like leaving uh, or coming out of the profession or leaning out, as they say, and she was one that I contacted and said, I need help. She had never met me, all I knew, social media, all, I, all she knew about me was through social media on Twitter, and I sent her a, a, a direct message on Twitter and said, can I have a conversation, please? And for a period of six months, she mentored me, and I really credit, apart from God, I credit her for the reason why I, I remained and stuck within um, national role. Encouraging and empowering others to communicate, I think that's really important. So we do that through World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. We provide resources and tools for others to be able to use. And you can see there that we have a communication toolkit that we responded in response to colleagues saying, how do we communicate? How do we talk to our comms team? And so we respond to that and, and develop that. Antibiotic Guardian Schools Ambassador is another one that um, I, I led on. Um, it's been a pilot, it's been a pilot for three years because of the pandemic, we've not been able to expand. But it encourages healthcare professionals and scientists to go to local schools and youth groups and to talk to children about tackling, about antibiotic resistance, about infection prevention and control, about hand hygiene. And and children can take an action and then get a badge. We evaluate it, and you can see there a couple of quotes from scientists and healthcare professionals who have been involved. It's talked about provides the ambassador with the knowledge and support and resources to carry out approved and engaging activities. And then one says there, the children have posters for homework. I told you, um, when children get homework, it's for the parents, really. So they discuss the session at home with family members as well. And so far, we've had more than 110 ambassadors. Actually, 110 in 2021, which was our largest year. But so far, 228 healthcare professionals and scientists have volunteered their time. Um, I encourage and, and work with um, Chief, Pharmacy, uh, Chief Pharmaceutical Clinical Fellows, and again, when they come and work with me through a mentoring, a leadership year at UKHSA or PHE as it was then, they have to take on some of my comms role. I always say to them, you need to be able to do everything that I do, and so they do get stretched to do that. Um, through the CWPAMS program I talked about earlier, I'm, this is one of the things that I'm so proud and honoured to have been able to lead the development of the globe, first set of Global Health Fellows. We had 16 in the first year, and additional funding now means that we now have 29 pharmacists who are Global Health Fellows. That means that not only are they continuing to, to communicate within, their, um, within the UK, but they're also learning and communicating and learning how to communicate and encourage um, others as well, globally as well. Um, we have Antibiotic Garden Shared Awards and Learning, and that's an opportunity to, to, to give back to those who take action uh, and for us to be able to reward them for the, the significant activity they've done. And we've done that yearly since 2017 in collaboration with um, for all of us, BSAC and HEE. Um, and we always have an honorary guest, and so we've had all the chief professional officers, the chief pharmacist, chief medical officer, chief veterinary officers, uh, at some point to, to come share with us um, their, their vision and also, um, and then it was live, but we've now moved to a virtual approach. And then all those um, entries are peer reviewed, and we make them available as shared learning. All the ones that are shortlisted are made available as shared learning on the platform. I started to go beyond AMR, so um, back during COVID, um, through the COVID pandemic, we're, we're, we're still there. Um, I, I started to, I started to think, what can I do differently? Um, I, I wanted to focus, continue to focus on AMR because a lot of my colleagues were, were diverted and, and moving on to focus on COVID, but I was able to stay and to try and focus on AMR. But the one thing I, did, I was able to do was to start to use those skills that I had gained to share with people on how to address vaccine hesitancy and also train students to become champions. And then again, during that time, um, I was working with BWIH, um, which is uh, Black Women in health and we started to provide um, videos educating the public on a range of um, awareness topics, cervical cancer, um, uh, breast cancer and also mental health uh, as examples. So my thank yous, again, I'm just going to thank Professor Liz Suckett and um, Emma Banks for nominating me, Microbiology Society, for awarding me this prize lecture. Um, I put here that it takes a village to raise a child. Um, actually, it's taken a village, taken lots and several colleagues across the country and, and internationally for me to be standing here today. 
Um, I, I say I stand on, on, on the shoulder of, of giants who have supported me, who have challenged me, who have um, given me new knowledge and, and stretched me, and there are colleagues who are across multiple organizations. But again, my colleagues, my, the core team that I've been part of at Health Protection Agency, Public Health England and UK Health Security Agency, developers de deserve a special mention alongside my family, particularly my parents, siblings, my mother-in-law, my husband and my children. I traveled a lot um, pre-COVID, pre and so being able to do that could only have happened with the support of others around me. And to God, without women, none of this will be possible. I am very grateful. I invite you um, to choose a pledge and become an antibiotic guardian. Um, and as I speak to you, more antibiotic guardian is going um, across the globe and to um, more countries in Africa um, in, the in the next couple of weeks as colleagues go over there um, to educate and to share knowledge and to communicate about tackling antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. So I'm sure you will all agree that was a, a brilliant and insightful lecture. And I'm delighted to present to you with the 2022 Peter Wilde Prize Lecture Certificate.